Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. My name is Nell Pepper, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so pleased to introduce this virtual event with Barney Scout Mann presenting his new book, Journeys North, the Pacific Crest Trail, in conversation with Liz Snorkel Thomas. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you for joining us virtually tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community during these challenging times. Every week we'll be hosting events here on our Zoom account. Just like always, our event schedule will appear on our website at harvard.com and you can sign up for our email newsletter for more updates. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we will get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be, hosting, I'll be posting a link to purchase Journeys North on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series and of our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. We thank you so much for showing up and tuning in in support of our authors and for the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings recently, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. Thank you for your patience and understanding. And now I am delighted to introduce our speakers. Barney Scout Mann has hiked the Appalachian, Pacific Crest, and Continental Divide trails. He has been board chair of the Pacific Crest Trail Association and is president of the Partnership for the National Trail System. He has been recognized with a Lowell Thomas Journalism Award and is the co-author of the Pacific Crest Trail, Exploring America's Wilderness Trail and author of the Continental Divide Trail, Exploring America's Ridgeline Trail. Liz Snorkel Thomas is a professional hiker, speaker, and writer who held the women's self-supported speed record on the 2,181 mile Appalachian Trail from 2011 to 2015. Liz is a former outdoor staff writer for the New York Times Wirecutter and current editor-in-chief for the outdoor web magazine Treeline Review. She is the author of Long Trails, Mastering the Art of the Thru-Hike, which, which received the 2017 National Outdoor Book Award for Best Instructional Book. Tonight, they'll be discussing Barney's new book, Journeys North, the Pacific Crest Trail. In Journeys North, Barney Scout Mann recounts his experience hiking the Pacific Crest Trail in, in 2007 with his wife, Sandy, trail wife, trail name Frodo, and four others. These six very different hikers form friendships and encounter astonishing challenges as they walk 20 to 30 miles a day through extreme drought and early winter storms from Mexico to Canada. Author and hiker Susan Alcorn calls Journeys North a rich tale of adventure, freedom, accomplishment, fears, and tears. You need to read this book. And Nicholas Kristoff praised Journeys North made me long for the trail. And now I'm honored to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours, Barney and Liz. Thank you so much now for that introduction. Uh, Barney, I understand that you, are you still here? Do we have some technical difficulties? Um, bear with me one moment. Okay. <laughs> There's Barney. No, thank you so much for that introduction. Bernie, I would like to start this reading off uh, before I ask you some questions um, with a reading from an excerpt of your book that, that so beautifully describes some of the trials and tribulations of being on a long distance hiking trail. Um, I, I'll let you start with that reading there. 
Oh, uh, Barney, I think you're on mute. Yeah. All right. Now I am? Now you're all set. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so hopefully everyone can hear me now. It doesn't say mute. And just like I'm about to read you a part, a part of the trials and tribulations of the trail, uh, we just had, we just had, I'm sitting here and I'm ready to go. Been um, visiting with my uh, uh, co-host for a half hour and boom, our internet shuts down. So what we have here is the same thing we do in a trail. We look for alternates. And so let's all pray for a moment for my phone, which is, <laughs> which is the uh, internet connection I'm going off. And I'm giving my uh, stink eye to my local, uh, uh, to, to my uh, uh, home internet connection. So here we go. This is, the, um, this is the introduction to Journey Snore. I cannot tell you how many times I've written and rewritten it. And at the time itself, we are, we've been on trail for five months. We are so close to Canada, we can taste it. You'll hear about me, Scout, my wife, Frodo, Sandy, and about Blazer. Here it is, introduction. Frodo's birthday. Mm. Blazer couldn't feel her toes. October 2nd, 2007. In the pre-dawn gloom, the 25-year-old stomped a path over a foot of fresh snow, but the effort barely blunted the cold. This was the second blizzard in three days as the Gulf of Alaska hurled once in a generation storms at Washington's Cascade Range. After five months hiking the Pacific Crest Trail, Blazer was wearing her fifth pair of Russell's sinews and joints. She'd come over 2,600 miles, only 40 left to reach Canada. She had sworn days before, I'll crawl if I have to. Right behind her, Frodo and I, brushed fat snowflakes from our bent shoulders and packs. A dim light penetrated the pine and spruce thicket. Happy birthday, Frodo, Blazer piped up. We jerked as if poked. In the 30 years we've been married, I had never forgotten Frodo's birthday. But this time, focused on the cold, on not getting lost, and on surviving, we both had. What do you want for your birthday, Blazer asked. Frodo, her breath visible, didn't hesitate. I want to finish the day alive. Two more storms swept in over the next three days, smothering the Pacific Crest Trail in thigh-high drifts. On Thursday night, Seattle King 5 TV News reported, three Pacific Crest Trail hikers are missing. Chatter lit up the internet within minutes. Goodness, it's so cold now. May the Lord protect them. Past midnight, one of 60 soon-to-be rescuers wrote, I am headed out to Stevens Pass to work the search. But... They weren't searching for us. They were searching for Nadine. Yeah. I have a couple of uh, images. Only two times I'm going to show you guys photos. But um, this is the first one. And the images I'm going to show you are going to start with, um, um, and I need to ask the host to, uh, to share with me. Nell, screen sharing is disabled because I rejoined. Oh, yes. And I'm sure uh, you're listening. There we go. Yeah. Technology is great, isn't it? <laughs> Let's get it working in our favor. All right, let's try this again. Okay. There we go. Okay. And share. And one more step. Okay. This is three nights before the introduction was written. The night it started snowing. Yeah. This is two days before. We are retreating for the first time off a of cutthroat pass. In front are hikers with the trail names Guts and Chuck Wagon and look what's in their beard. And the woman right behind them, that's Blaze. And she's smiling only because I'm a camera out, not for any good reason. Her zipper is broken in her jacket and she has lost a glove and one hand is thrust down her pants because it's the only way to keep it some semblance. This is the day before in about the only moment it was safe for me to take out my camera. There's Frodo, and I'll show you in a moment what she's actually hiking in. It's snowing, and the next morning we're gonna wake up and we'll forget her birthday. Yeah, there we go. I'll show you what I'm wearing. This is what I was wearing, not boots, 
you know? And not only was it wearing this, and I hate to do this for you, but let's show the uh, you know, two holes to it. This is the, uh, the actual shoe I was wearing in that, when I took the photo. If you can read it, it says Timberline Lodge to Canada. There you go. And that's probably TMI too much, but uh, back to you, Liz. Well, that's such a delight having the chance to see your shoes, Barney. I, uh, in all of my hiking, I don't think I have a pair of shoes that I hung on to. So that really must have been a very special moment to, to keep those trail riders close to your heart after all of these years. <laughs> so thank you so much for that excerpt and sharing those photos. Uh, now, as, we're, as I was reading Journeys North, one of the things that I was really wondering about is sort of this prequel to how you decided to hike the Pacific Crest Trail. And how did you and your wife, Frodo, uh, decide to hike the trail together as uh, a through hiking coach, someone who consults people as they decide to go off on a long distance hike? It's actually really, really pretty rare for couples to hike together for the entire length of a trail. Um, and one of the things that really surprised me too is you mentioned that it was your 30th anniversary together. Uh, what, what drew the two of you to this adventure to celebrate an anniversary instead of say a European tour? Well, as a starting point, let me share with you that um, my wife has uh, later let me know that if I wasn't a backpacker when I met her, I wouldn't be sitting here 43 years married. And actually let me have her join me this is a uh, one of the fun of doing this is um, a lot of these questions are geared to the two of us and in the book this is frodo this is sandy sandy man and by the way this is a uh, there we go we got to share the screen this is what 43 years of marriage looks like yeah it wasn't that we um we said oh it's our 30th wedding anniversary and how are we going to celebrate it's really the opposite it was more by chance We've been a backpackers forever. We took our backpacking, much to my share, parents' chagrin. and said, what are you doing with our first grandson? He'll get dirty. You're taking him into dangerous places. Well, he obviously survived. And we backpacked every year. Each one of our, uh, each one of our uh, three kids, they went on their first backpack under their own power at age four. Um, and so in the 90s, we started, we live in the West Coast, both of us absolutely love the Sierra Nevada. Yeah. Um, do you remember when you first heard about the Pacific Crest Trail? Yes, so we were actually living in Oregon at the time. I was an undergraduate at the University of Oregon. And um, we were out hiking in the Cascades on a trail in the Three Sisters area. And there was a trail marker and you had heard of it and you could explain it to me, but that was the first time I had heard yeah. of the PCT. And I had first heard the Pacific Crest Trail before it actually became or officially became the Pacific Crest Trail. Uh, I'm 68. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> happy to admit that. I was 13 and I went on a 50 mile backpack with the Boy Scouts. And we were a substantial portion of the Pacific Crest Trail. We saw all of the entire week. We saw two other, uh, uh, two other hikers. Yeah. So in the 90s, both of us got in our heads, maybe we want to do this. Now we did have one difference of opinion though. I thought it'd be great to take two summers to do it. <laughs> I, I was cowed by this, you know, 20 to 25 miles yeah. per day idea. But that was partly because we hadn't yet discovered or switched over to ultralight backpacking. In the early 2000s, we switched and hard aluminum frames to what's called um, uh, ultralight and it was a big deal, big difference. 2003, we did the John Muir Trail, uh, 211 miles to see, do we still really want to do this? Because if you want to do, it, to do a long hike, you have to really, really want to do it because it's too painful <laughs> if you don't want to do it, you know, or, or if you don't just have that strong, strong desire. We did the JMT, John Muir Trail in 2003. We came off it still wanting to do it. Yep. And it was more, when is the next year we can do it? She was a, a high school science teacher. I was a managing partner in a law firm. Yes, folks, I'm a lawyer. Let's get that out in the open. <laughs> yeah, fine. And we both basically pushed a lot of chips across the table uh, to make this happen. I remember uh, um, when you were trying to get permissions. Yes, yeah, so it was 
not an easy thing to get a leave of absence that included the end of one school year and the beginning of another because typically you hike from April to September or October. Um, so basically I had to say your choices are I go and I come back or I go and I don't come back. So I've, I've had a good successful AP biology program and they were happy to have me come back. Yeah. And me, I basically uh, uh, put two younger partners in charge and I called them once a month while we were out there. But Liz, you're really right. There are very few uh, number of people who uh, uh, couples go out there. Um, the normal experience is I'll see someone and some of the first words out of, the, out of their mouth is, my wife or my husband is back home and maybe I'll see him once this summer. That's hard. That's hard. We, we were so lucky to have the two of us. And, um, and it, when, one of the things that's lucky about it is that it's really nice when you come home to have someone to share the memories with. And, and to, yeah. Yeah. So and I understand you have some photos of some of your early backpacking trips together <laughs> uh, that you're willing to so share. As a, and maybe one from the trail itself. As a, uh, <laughs> as a wedding present from our families, uh, this was the, this is what the most important thing I asked for is, would you go on a 10 day backpack with us <laughs> in our wedding summer? And I'm going to screen share and you'll see uh, what the two of us look like on a, on a, that, uh, on that trip. Let's go back to actually I have to exit that first. Here we go. Okay. And now screen share. Oh no. Now I go back to it. Let's go out of it. We'll be all good today. It's Having good. some internet issues. I don't think that's it. Go back to here. Your screen share again. Yeah, you know, we all practiced this beforehand. We were so good, weren't we, Liz? We were really we good. We did. It was so easy. Oh, okay. and it looks like we're. It, these photos are worth it. Here we go. Right. Uh, now I do watching in right now. Screen. Yeah, well, folks, they <laughs> like this. <laughs> and we were wearing all cotton. Yeah, every cotton screen. kills. We just didn't know that. Look at those boots I'm wearing. Those boots weigh at least two and a half pounds each. My tent doesn't weigh that these days. And look. I'm six feet, and how much taller is that pack on my back? Yeah, here in 10 days. What year is this? 77. That's right. We better get that right. It's the year we were married. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we look so and, young. Uh, fast forward, do you have another photo of the two of you backpacking together? Is that I do. And if you're squeamish, you, you might want to. Uh, oh, no. Is no. that one you chose? Yeah, I chose go that ahead. one. Here we go. So, what's this? This is uh, us with no hair. Yeah. We really thought, well, actually, one of us thought <laughs> when we reached the, the trail midpoint, we need to do something to mark this. And this is the idea that occurred to me. We ought to shave our heads. And I'll have it be a surprise for my wife. I won't tell her before then. Yeah. Took a little convincing. Uh, a little like, bit little more than that. About it. I actually had a friend hike in 10 miles to this spot. Uh, it's not by a trailhead. He brought in portable saving equipment. And I looked at Frodo and I said, I said, Sand, I'm going to shave my head and I suggest you do so too. And here was her response. She reared up to all five foot two of herself and she looked me in the eye. This is a quote unquote. And she said, Absolutely not. No way. Now here's what I know. Those of you in a long-term relationship, you'll 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 you'll, you'll preach it. Here's what I know at that moment. I know that's not necessarily the final answer. But I know if I say one word, it will be. Yeah. So I kneel down, uh, shave my head. People are taking photos, it's a, and I know what she's thinking. She's th uh, thinking. When am I ever going to do, you know, have a chance? What to better chance would I have? What better opportunity to do something like this? And it actually sort of looks like fun. So she did it. Yeah. All right. You, you've seen enough of that photo, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's one thing I love about the book is that throughout you have these rituals and routines that really liven up an already very exciting hike with, with a very human element that, that connects the two of you. Uh, you know, one of the other things that I think makes Journeys North so interesting is that both of you started hiking the PCT as what I call mid to late career professionals. Uh, you're not the, the typical demographic of through hikers, which tend to be people in their early 20s out of college or perhaps retirement age. And throughout the book, uh, you embrace the status as sort of a trail mom and trail dad to 
many of the characters in the book, these people in their early 20s who maybe need a little bit of guidance or support on their trip. And one of the things as a hiker myself that, that shocked me, that really, really impressed me is that how, how are you able to balance caring the challenges and physical pain and hunger and navigation and weather and everything that happens to you too personally on a hike while also keeping an eye out for so many other people who are around you? I don't know that we could have not. It's just seemed natural for us. But it also was, was a two-way street in that we interacted with a lot of younger people and um, yeah, offered guidance or help in, in some situations, but we also got a lot back from dealing with oh, them. Tremendously. Yeah, they were and really wonderful people. It, it's sort of the same token. These days we are what's called trail angels in San Diego. And I don't think we'll go into it much, but last year, starting Pacific Crest 2 hikers stayed at our house one, two, three nights. And the numbers, this is not a typo. <laughs> we, over eight weeks, we had 1,200 people stay at our house. Saw gratis, we're able to do it. And on the trail, it's a bit the same way. We are all, we have shed so much of our, of our normal life, so much of our things, and we look out for each other and we happen to be parental yeah. types. I think maybe we are missing our kids. And so all these, <laughs> all these young people out there, you were all, you were all our kids. And it's so much of positive feedback loop. We knew someone was having trouble or someone just needed an ear to listen to. And it's this tremendous positive feedback loop. We also had some resources that some of them didn't have That's access to. We knew people along the trail. Oh, and they were yeah. getting picked up at various places. Yeah, yeah. we could. Uh, it's so many places. Since, since we, we have been around, and we know people in all three states, we could very often, instead of having to hitch into town, uh, it was one trail town, we had a cousin drive our van up there, and we could play Magic Van the whole weekend, drive people around for their errands. Uh, and it was really a, a, a delight to be able to do that. Uh, yeah, it's just so much. Uh, it's a bit just who we are. Yeah, which is why, which is why in part, um, I was motivate, motivated to write the book. Because the first yeah, draft, yeah, there's, oh, go, go ahead. The uh, first draft took me three years and 10 months to write. Many morning at 5 a.m. in the morning, the next sentence would finally pop into my head and I'd get up and I'd go. Late that night, Frodo's already sleeping. And why? Because I really wanted to tell these stories so often out there. Yeah, and you know, one the, so there's quite a folks, few. I would find I may You go, Liz. Ah. All right, all right. I think there was a little bit of, of stalling on your end, so I thought I, I didn't hear anything. Uh, really, this is feeding in, into what you were talking about so much is, is that there's quite a few narrative books written about through hiking. Um, and one of the things that I love about your book that makes Journeys North different, in my opinion, is, is this character development, not just of the two of you following you as you grow and learn and have crazy things happen to you on trail, but you're following, as a reader, you're following six, more than six different hikers, but six main hikers juggling their, their growth from where they were before they started hiking all the way to their growth, 100 miles in, 200 miles in, all the way to the end. And, and how they've been able to, um, how, how you document in first person, what, what's going on in their head? How are they changing? And w one of the things that I ask you as a writer, um, you know, it's very interesting because you're almost a side character in your own book, which is an interesting way of, of writing a book. Uh, you know, as a writer, can you talk about the process of understanding where each of these hikers were at the zero mile mark, at the 200 mile mark, at the 1000 mile mark, where they were mentally, emotionally during and after the hike. And, yeah. and what sort of interviews and trust, what sort of trust did you have to build to tell other people's stories, uh, many of them very personal, and give them the accuracy and the care that, that they, they deserve? So it, it's not just personal stories I became privy to, but some really searing ones. And in fact, why I started to write the book is I wanted people to feel what it's really like to be out there on the trail. On the trail, we will have almost every day a conversation you might have once a year with a best friend. So I became, I became, I would hear stories. Maybe I was the second or third person uh, to, uh, to hear it. And so afterwards, I wanted to share what it was like. And when I first was contemplating doing the book, 
I was actually going to do, the format was going to be historical fiction. All the background people would be real. And in the front, I'd have two, three, four people in the foreground who would be fictional, but would evoke the same degree of feelings and have the same degree of, uh, of, uh, of backstories. And finally, this woman here, Frodo, looked at me and said, you know, because I thought they would never want me to tell their stories. Blazer, if you heard about introduction, yeah. she would never want me to share this. And Frodo said, you've made an assumption. You need to ask. And I remember the day I asked Blazer. It was in DC, it was cold and blustery. We're all bundled up. And I look at her and I'm very careful with words. And here's the question I asked her. The question was, you wouldn't want me to write about you, would you, Blazer? I was expecting the negative. And she looks at me and here's what she says. She says, Scout, I trust you. It would be okay. You can knock me over with a feather. Now, it's one thing to say that. We repaired means, because if I'm going to write about you, if I was writing about you, Liz, this is what I tell you. I would tell you, I write with care and compassion, but it has to all be real. Nothing, there's no off limits now. In a year from now, you can't say, well, I'm sorry, Scout, you know, this slice is off and this slice is off. And Blazer, Tony, Nadine, Dalton, each one of them, each one of them, they've trusted me with their stories. It still amazes me. They have been, you know, in, in, in one, actually all of them, but particularly with, with Blazer, there's one real searing. I was the, after her mother and her, and her doctor, I was the next person to know, and this was 10 years after the fact. And she wanted, what she wanted was when this happened, she felt so alone as a person can ever feel and so ashamed as a person ever feel. And she says, Scout, if one person, one young girl reading your book feels a little bit less alone and a little bit ashamed, it makes it all the worthwhile telling stories. And the other thing I have to do is if I'm telling theirs, I have to tell ours with the same degree of truthfulness. I hope I've done that. Yeah. I'm actually going to throw something in here. So on the trail, there were people who totally spilled their guts to scout. Um, in the Kennedy Meadows uh, shower stall, just hiking along. I'm a scientist and I'm not as good a listener as he is, I think. So I didn't, I didn't get some of those confidences. But I also want to say that the, some of the main, character, main characters in the book were very patient and very giving of their time and energy. And we really appreciated that, both of us. Yeah. I conducted a sip, I interviewed 70 different people for the book. Of the key players, I mean, I'll call it characters, so they're all wonderful people. I interviewed them multiple times, gave me access to their journals, yeah. personal photos. Uh, Blazer in particular, I'm, I'm not exaggerating, she must have, I think, a thousand emails over those three years that, oh, yeah. that the subject line is, one more question or <laughs> more questions. And that, that she has to stay true to this. But it was, yeah. So, oh, you're, I, you're still there. And this is actually a wonderful segue for a, a, another question for you. About halfway through the book, there's a big reveal about the two of you. And I'm not going to go into too many details for those who haven't read the book. Um, but as two trail moms and trail dads for, for the 7,000 hikers have stayed at your house, uh, prominent people within the hiking community. Can you walk through the process of, of why you decided to write publicly about yourself in that way, knowing so many people know you personally and will know this about your background? And what do you hope readers will get from this reveal? How do you think it fits within the greater context and message of the book? That's you. Okay, that's me. <laughs> I will say, I wasn't consulted. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else signed a waiver except you. Um, but I was a little less enthusiastic about it than someone else. Yeah. I regard it as a gift to tell the story. This is, this is my truth. Every time she touches me, every time I make her laugh, I notice it. Because 
we had three years where that wasn't the case. We actually separated for three years. I won't go. Okay, sorry. Let them read. I'll let them read. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I regard it as a gift when I tell that story to someone. And it took me a long time to actually be, be semi-comfortable and then comfortable to tell it. Because here's the deal. Uh, when I was younger, I'd look at with someone who's 50 years married or someone who's 40 years married, long-term relationships. And I'd see, I'd see this, right? And I'd see them holding hands. And I would think that that's what the truth is. And that it's easy. And that it's easy. And here's what the truth really is. Every long-term marriage, every long-term partnership between people has had their moments of pure heck. And when it happened to us, I thought we're the only ones. There must be something really wrong with us. And I thought, we shouldn't go be seeing, seeking help. And what we're here to say today, one of the reasons why I wrote about it and wanted to, is that it's worthwhile to work at it and to try and get to the other side. I get to go to bed. Oh, gosh, I get mushy. <laughs> I get to go to bed every night with my soulmate. And, and that's, vice versa. And that's, that is just so precious. And I live without her for a while. Um, so it, it was important to me to, to, to share this story. And I love, you know, I so love that it's going to be in so many hands and people are going to read about it. And I think, you know, so many of us hikers out there who stayed at your house see the two of you as, as those people who've been married for 50 years. And, and to read about it, it is, I'm sure, brings a lot of people hope. Yeah. So back to sort of the trials and tribulations, not just the emotional and social aspect of the trail, but uh, towards the end of the book, you and Frodo, as you read from that excerpt, experienced some of the worst weather I have ever heard of, of three hikers running into, uh, especially that early in the season. Did the word quit ever cross your mind, either of your minds, uh, either at the end as, as you're getting blizzard number three or uh, other times when both of you have uh, had some physical accidents along the trail. Um, in the context of today's PCT hikers too, one of the things that I think about a lot is, seems like every year in, in recent times, in October, there's a rescue in Washington, there's helicopters, hikers go missing and still haven't been found, and it's, it's heartbreaking. So in your opinion, when, having been there in the thick of things, in, in the whiteout, what, when is the opinion, when is the right time to call it? And, you know, one of the other things, too, is, you know, the big elephant in the room is COVID-19. And there were hikers on the trail, either on the trail or planning to get on the trail this season. And what factors go into those hikers' minds then when they decide to get off the trail or choose not to get on at all for this year? So there's about six questions in there. <laughs> yes, there are. Uh, but let's start with the, uh, um, uh, did you ever think about quitting question? You know? So I would not go quite that far, but I will admit that Northern California was really tough for me. You've gone past the really gorgeous scenery of the High Sierra, you're not yet in the gorgeous scenery of the Washington Cascades, and my feet were really hurting all the time. Mm -hmm. So I thought about it, I, you know, if I had been alone, maybe I would have done it if I hadn't been with Scout. Um, but then when we crossed into Oregon that first day, I fell and broke a tooth and knocked out a tooth part way. And in dealing with that situation, I came to realize that, boy, I really, really don't want to have to get off the trail. So that was healthy for me to know. So my truth here is the entire five months, I never thought about quitting. I never did. Um, I always wanted to be out there. I always did. I never once thought about our waterbed at home. And yes, folks, we have a water. <laughs> I <laughs> did. I thought about it. <laughs> never once thought about our waterbed. Um, I fell and I broke a rib. I didn't think about quitting um, and had some, you know, had, had a measure of really hard times up there. And at the very end, never once thought about quitting. It was, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this safely? Yes. We did not want anyone to have to come rescue us. So we did keep that in mind. Yeah. And that ties into your last question because, uh, or the heart of it is when do people know they know that they should quit? And as you read in the book, and from the introduction, um, we're out there on Frodo's birthday because this is the second time we've covered the same final ground because we did need to turn around the first time. And one of the 
the things I found so often is uh, uh, that I'd have, if you carry away uh, from this, is what Frodo says to me when she drops me off at the trailhead, because I did the Appalachian Trail uh, without her, and a number of times she did support. And her final words to me are not, I love you. Though I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, her final word before I walk off into the wilderness is make wise decisions. Yeah. And that's in the time of COVID. That's in the time you're walking into bad weather or you're deciding to turn around. That's the time when you're looking at a difficult stream crossing and you decide, I'm going to wait for someone else. It takes an hour or two hours. Or you make that hardest of all decisions. I'm going to turn and find an alternate way. Yeah. Be careful, please. So my last question, and, and I see we're, we're coming up on our time, uh, is after you finished the PCT, you immediately found out what it takes to be on the Pacific Crest Trail Association's board, and you write, sometimes it helps being a lawyer. And you've been on the, uh, the chair of the Continental Divide Trail Coalition, as well as the president of the partnership of the National Scenic Trails. So what advice would you have for those of us hikers without law degrees? How do you think we can best contribute to the trail uh, to public lands after a hike and why? I think one of the, the questions that a lot of hikers, both people who are very experienced, spend a lot of time on trail and also people who are just learning about the trails are curious about is the, the PCT is complete. It goes through already so much federally protected land, federally protected wilderness. Why does it matter that, that we continue to advocate for trails? What, what's still left to do on the PCT? Yeah, so let me start with a letter that was written to the PCTA by a finishing through hiker. And here's how the letter begins. I can still recall it. Began, I just finished my through hike and I feel a quiet sense of rage. I just walked through miles of blowdowns, miles of washed out trails. I walked through sections where there clearly has been no maintenance for ages. It looks like no one cares. The year was 1991. PCTA, the Pacific Crest Trail Association, had yet to hire its first employee. The year you hiked it, Liz, the year we hiked it, if anyone went out and walked a section, walked, they hiked it today, you would feel largely, this is a resource that's well taken care of. And why? Because last year, 100,000, 100,000 trail maintenance hours were donated by people like all of us here who are listening in the day. People picking up loppers, picking up, uh, um, I'm, I'm looking at a cross cut saw that happens to be on a wall, and going out and donating some, sec some uh, sweat e equity. Trails don't disappear in a generation. Trails disappear overnight. Sections are burned out, sections are washed out. Um, uh, everything happens to a trail. And if you don't get out there, so we say, okay, well, you know, maybe I don't feel like uh, spending some time <laughs> doing the hard labor. The key thing for you and for everyone, some way show up for our outdoors and some way show up for trails. Join a local trail group, wherever you are. You're on the East Coast, growing the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, uh, 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 the uh, Appalachian Mountain Club. There are so many, it is pitiful, good organizations, because then you show up. And what, what do you get? Well, I'm president of the Partnership for the National Trail System, the umbrella group for all 30 national scenic and historic trails of which the Appalachian Trail and the Continental, Continental Divide Trail and Pacific Crest Trail, there are three of those 30. I got our team, partnership, we got a face-to-face -face 90 minutes with the chief of the U.S. Forest Service this last February. She chose our meeting to announce a 10-year Forest Service-wide trail challenge. And why? Because we have, amongst our 30 trail organizations, we have 150,000 members. And we only have that because folks like each and every one of you in some manner have decided to show up. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, I'm gonna do one thing. There's a guy who I know is gonna to attend today. Uh, Ron Tipton, volunteer for the partnership, for vice president. He used to be in his professional life. Uh, he used to be the executive director of Appalachian Trail Conservancy. And what is he doing in his retirement? He is spending hours upon hours ensuring that we are purchasing those gaps in the PCT and in other trails and in so many ways contributing. And Ron is one of just many, but it's a pleasure for me to say his name. And before we switched over to questions, which I know we're gonna do soon, uh, there were two other things I wanted to say. And one, 
Liz, for Snorkel, I really appreciate you doing this with me today. It's a lot of fun. And uh, I know we're talking about my book, Journeys North, but I at least wanted to put in a plug for one, for one effort you're working on. Uh, uh, TreeLineReview.com, folks. Uh, the uh, Consumer Reports for the Outdoors. Uh, Liz and a team of people have found it and working on it and encourage you to go out there. And then a final plug, just as Nell said, is for independent bookstores and endangered species. I love walking into an independent bookstore. Something feels different, the way people care about it. It's just the way it smells, seeing staff picks. And if each of us on this call don't in some manner support them today when they have been you know, they've been slapped around the face by, uh, the, the, by the present circumstances. So I would like it if you went off uh, and bought Journeys North, but maybe today, regardless, go on their website and buy something for a friend, buy a children's book, but please support them. because so I really appreciate what they're doing to allow me the forum. Oh, <laughs> and my, my wife makes sure that we show the cover <laughs> of Journeys North while we're doing it. All right, back to you, Liz, and then uh, uh, we'll, we'll uh, tee up for some questions with Nell and folks. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing your story and sharing some of the backstory behind your thinking and process of putting together Journeys North. It really was a pleasure to read. And I've read many, many through hiking books, and this one is blows them out of the, the water. So thank you so much for the amount of time and interviews and stories you were able to tell. Thank well, you. I think at this point, uh, we have about 15 minutes for Q&A. And at this point, I'd like to bring Nell back on, who will read us some questions. And as usual, if you have a question, feel free to drop it into the chat and we will be able to answer it from there. Uh, yep, yeah, so in the, in the Q&A, we have uh, some great questions here. So first one uh, is from Ron Tipton. How did this hike? <laughs> <laughs> yep. yeah, so he's on. Um, how did this hike 14 years ago shape the rest of your life? Your, cons your careers, your family connections, and your life goals. Well, I wouldn't be here right now, for one thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so many ways. I don't sweat the small stuff anymore. I mean, I've hiked from Mexico to Canada, and I know it really matters. And so, phew, I go. Um, I take showers today because I know I'm supposed to, not because I feel dirty. <laughs> I know what dirty is really like. And let me just say one thing. Um, it was intentional that um, Liz and I and Frodo too, that um, we, we chose to be in the same color. And you may think that's pretty odd for hikers. But I was thinking about it, Liz. You know, we do the same thing on the trail. We all wear the, shade, the, the same oh. shade of dirt, right? Brown and gray. <laughs> we don't get to decide which shade it is. So many ways I've had these avenues open where I get to affect in a, in a positive manner. Um, uh, how our outdoors and how our trails are cared for. I never would have done that, but for having hiked on the Pacific Crest Trail. Yeah. So many people are in our lives. So many stories, so many, you know, these, these 7,000 people that over, over uh, 15 years have slept at our house, <laughs> never would have met them. We have, uh, Liz, you referred to, you know, people that we regard as our trail children different countries yeah. yeah we can we can travel anywhere any country in the world i'm serious and we have doors open they would love to stay with us we were at fourteen thousand feet in the himalayas in a tiny little tea hut and a guy comes up to our little group at the table and says do you know who you're sitting with this is scott and frodo i stayed in their house last spring <laughs> wow wow <laughs> But partly to answer the question, I would also say, man, we would have so much free time. <laughs> but I don't know what we would, you know, this is really important to us and it's very fulfilling, both the hosting and your advocacy work. Yeah. yeah. And next uh, we have, hi, Scout and Frodo, Spruce here. I stayed at your house before my 2018 Lash from Campo to Yosemite, thank you. Do you ever miss trail life and how do you feel with those, how do you deal with those feelings? What advice do you give to hikers who can't get out into the back country but miss being on trail? Mm. Ooh. So I only did one through hike. He did, he's done three. Um, I only had one through hike in me. So he's had a lot more time on the trail. We both really, really need to get out in nature 
on a regular basis. Um, we are going to go out on a week-long backpack trip in the Sierra in early September. We're really looking forward to that. Um, I can't hike 20 miles a day anymore. My feet are not in that kind of shape. I've had some issues. Um, but yeah, I mean, we really love being out there. Yeah. That's a big part of our lives. So I'll answer us, Bruce, with, uh, with this. When I came off the Pacific Crest Trail, I mourned for a month. I was a basket case. I wouldn't, on the trail, many of us, we don't carry a wallet. We carry a baggie with our license in it. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't take my license and one credit card out of my baggie for a month. I wouldn't shave my beard. And then I realized I had to and had to move on. Uh, Frodo handled it three days after we're back. She's in her high school classroom facing down 35 students a period. It was yeah. really healthy for me to have kind of a groove to fit into. Yeah. Yeah. But in this time of COVID, we're all facing that. Yeah. We've all but knocked our path. And I'll tell you one thing that really helped me was literally just walking out the front door. I happened to have um, uh, one, of our, one of our children, um, daughter, was eight months pregnant when this all started. She had our two-year-old grandson and their day car got knocked sideways. She and her husband are strong people, but they fell out help. And we weren't gonna host hikers this year, as we it couldn't. turned out. So we jumped on a deserted Southwest jet and we spent three months there. Every day, 11 o'clock, I'd walk down the long block with my grandson. And within- Two-year-old. Two-year-old, with almost no time at all, people are stepping out and they're, you know, here, here's this old guy in silver hair and a young kid and they're waving. We would move around uh, one yard, we'd move around the garden gnomes and then they would start doing it. We would draw with sidewalk chalk. We'd say hello to people in that. Uh, a man who had a, um, a, a large sidewalk, uh, excuse me, a large swing hanging from a tree that was in disrepair. He invited us to use it and then he looked at the swing and realized it really wasn't. And the next day he's there, he's older than me. He's up on a 20 foot tall ladder repairing this. And just by walking outside, I had a community that was a bit like the trail. We all cared about each other. So still get out there, even though if it can't be in the, you know, the pristine outdoors we really like, still get out there. Good question. And Spruce, if I, I may add something that has been really important to me as I also like, like Scout mourned and mourned um, <laughs> For, for, for longer than a month after I finished my first trail and something that was so valuable to me was keeping in touch with my hiker friends. Um, you know, when you're on trail, you're walking, we think of it as a solitude act, but you're walking with a hundred or 400 of your best friends who all have things in common with you and similar val values. And then you go off back home where people don't understand why you wanted to spend five months getting muddy and dirty. So keeping in touch with those hiker friends and getting involved in organizations where people value trails, uh, either hiking organizations or trail building organizations, um, really that sort of social, I realize in COVID that's a little bit more difficult, but keeping up that social aspect, I think is one of the ways to keep that spirit alive and, and um, still feel a little bit like you're on trail. Yeah. And what Liz does also, you teach others yeah. from your skills out there. It's another way to both feel a part of the trail and do that, yeah. That's another way to do it. Yeah. All right. We have some great questions. We'll get through as much of them as we can. Uh, so the next one, um, did Aunt Prudence, Prudence give you good advice when times got tough in the snow? It's from Peter Young. <laughs> I could have told you who that was from. And that's <laughs> I have taught alongside uh, numerous times back in the 90s. And yes, Aunt Prudence was always with us. He would, uh, uh, in one of our teaching, teaching sessions, you know, I put up five images and he'd uh, put up this photo. Oh, we were teaching, uh, it was Boy Scouts and we we're teaching other adult leaders in part not to be afraid of these kids out there. Because <laughs> when you face down teenage boys and you're supposed to be teaching some, it can be a, uh, a little bit of fright, but also what to do in taking these young men. And thankfully these days, young women also and Scouts uh, outdoors. And he'd had this picture of this nice old woman looking prim and proper. And he said, this is my Aunt Prudence. And one thing I want you to know is I always take Prudence with me when I go on the mm -mm. course. Yeah. So we, yes, we did. And as I said, uh, the catchphrase I use is not Aunt Prudence. I use, uh, and Frodo uses, it's actually her phrase. Make that, wise decisions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And next we have a question that says, you, you backpacked in deep snow. 
what is the best time of year to miss the deep snow on the Pacific Crest Trail and Continental Divide Trail for backpackers doing the trails in chunks? Oh, in chunks. So first of all, uh, something I really want to say is, you know, we talk about through hiking and that's, that's like the tiniest tip of the iceberg. I so admire anyone who goes out, uh, who section hikes long sections. The log it's a logistical nightmare. They have to get themselves to obscure places. I just go through once. I get my blisters in day three, four, and five, and I'm through with them, largely. Mm -hmm. You're doing it every time. Those who go out for a week, those who go out for a weekend, those you go out for a day hike, you just simply dream about the trail. And every last one of you I respect. And every last one of you are appreciating the trail in the outdoors in a way that's important. So let me get back to the question. Which, what was the question? The question was what time of year for each <laughs> oh, kind of section. Yeah. So the spring is definitely best for Southern California. Um, you get some wildflowers. There might be some water still. Yeah. yeah. Um, each one of these trails, there are sections you could hike any time of the year. So New Mexico on the CDT, there's lot, long sections in there. You can hike any time. You think, oh my gosh, it's desert. Desert's beautiful. Hmm. Uh, so much. The biggest thing behind your question is please, please, please make sure you know what you're walking into. What are the conditions? Because there are beautiful times, North Cascades to go into, and that's find outable before you walk in. We walked through a, a closed section. Sorry, we did it. It wasn't officially closed, but there was a Forest Service Ranger who had put a sign, Northern Cascades, 45 miles of trails, Bridges had all been washed out in our, in our era. They're all rebuilt. Uh, and there was Forest Service, Hampton Stein basically said, don't go this route, go these alternate routes. Um, we went the original route, but we did so because we had talked to someone who had come the opposite way and gone through it. We had online just before uh, in a little town checked it out. And we went, we went through knowing what we would face and having assessed our skills. Yeah, I would say that for various chunks along the way, it depends on what the conditions were, how much snow there was that particular yeah. year. So the high Sierra, you really don't want to try and go through when there's lots of snow. Um, the North Cascades, again, you don't want to go through when there's lots of snow. So, um, yeah. I, you know, the high Sierra is great right after the snow because then you get lots of wildflowers. Um, the North Cascades, you just don't know when the snow is going to come. We've hiked in the, we've tried to hike in the North Cascades in early July and run into too much snow. Yeah. Um, but then you also can run into it in, you know, late September. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's hard to say. Yeah. The one thing I would add to that too, is in addition to snow these days, we're also thinking about wildfires. So keep keeping in mind, if the snow's gone, is there a fire danger? Is it still open? Um, as you said, doing some research ahead, ahead of time to make sure you know what you're going into. And the next question, what was the most heated battle between you and your editing team that you won and or lost? <laughs> oh, I'm interested in this one. <laughs> so it, when I heard the first, the, the first part of the question, I thought it would end up with between you and your wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually I'll answer that one too. Uh, <laughs> question. Here, the, the, the two of us, our strong suit has always been working on some project together. Just, we're very good at that. And this was just one big project. But what we had our most difficult time interpersonal wise was going into town. Yeah, mm. for the first half of the trail, because we just didn't quite talk through what our, ex our expectations yeah. were kind of different. Town, paradise, food. But we both had different Showers. business. Showers. And it wasn't until we actually, it took us, it, yeah, it took us almost half the trail before we actually talked about it. But oh God, give me a break. The, the things that are on the cutting room floor yeah. for this book. There's the chapter where a scout saved somebody's yeah. life. That whole chapter went on the floor. There's but it also depends on who your editing team was. Cause you had, a, you had, a, you had your own editors and then you had, yeah, anyway. Mount, uh, mount so there was a books. lot of clipping and cutting. Yeah, there was. And it's hard. In fact, in some instances it would take two or three different people or two or three different rounds before I'd suddenly say, you're right. And some of the most hardest things to cut out were stories that were just wonderful, dear, moving stories, which is what I like to write about. Uh, stories you might be on oh, tears at the end. Um, but what they did is they, they went sideways in the narrative. 
Yeah. And they drew you away from the main line in uh, the, 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 the weave of the story, in particular, the story of Burning Man. Um, and yeah. it's not only I saved his this life. Is, yeah, this is a, a hiker. A hiker. That's his trail. Yeah. It's also that in the middle of it, I had to make a choice, a bit, at least in my perspective, that I was be choosing between my wife and the possibility I might be able to find him. Um, and that moment, when I chose to go uh, to go the direction which ultimately led me to him, was was a real was a real hard moment for me. And I had to cut it. I'm leaving the floor. One of the oh, the people I had to leave out. There's people I owe. I'll apologize oh, to them yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> they have wonderful stories, and their story has ended up on the cutting room floor. And that is hard. That's hard for me. So what I do intend to do is I will be posting uh, some uh, director's cuts. Uh, either on my website, um, uh, Instagram, I might even actually read them, I like doing that. You know, what are the last things to go? This came so close to almost being it, because yeah. I still really want to share these stories. Good question. And let me see, since we're almost at time, so I think we'll do two last questions here. So we have um, one, while you were writing Journeys North, did you sometimes feel like you were writing a historical piece? The trail has changed so much since you hiked it. No, not at all. So I actually, um, um, I'm a student of trail history. It's unfortunate. Our trail history is, uh, was on the verge of disappearing. Someone in their 70s, someone in their 80s, and they have stuff stored away in a closet. And one of the things when I came back off the trail, I wanted to find out what these stories are. And I found no one had done any work whatsoever. Mm -hmm. They always talked about the father of the PCT, Clinton C. Clark, who always talked about himself in the third person. He did a lot. But the first person who really had the idea and pushed it was a woman, Catherine Montgomery. And no one knew anything about her. They had this one sentence. So she was, they sometimes say a teacher, sometimes say a founder of Western Washington University. And that's all they said about her. Mm -hmm. And I love so much. I had a chance to go back, discover who she was, write articles about her, find some in the most obscure places, find some dear photos of her. And I got to sit up in the state of Washington and hear her named the Northwest Woman of the Year mm -hmm. legacy and to preserve these stories. Go ahead. I was going to say, but that doesn't really answer the question. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the scientist. So I would say that... Um, the trail is different. There's far more people on it, but the, the trail experience itself, I yeah. think, really stays the same. It's still very, very similar to what we experienced 13 years ago. And I was going to get there. <laughs> but, <laughs> I did more no, you did it. So, talk more. so if you were to mention the name Milt Kinney in the 90s, Milt Kinney was regarded as the mayor of the trail. He was the one big hell angel, no trail experience was out in the Shasta city, uh, about 60% uh, of the way up trail in Northern California without having Milt Kinney pick you up and drive you down the freeway to the nearest town in mm. his uh, jalopy at 20 miles an hour on the freeway. Who has heard of his name this day? Yeah. But those people, if they were sitting here with us and they were sitting with people who hike today, what we share are the real important things the being in the outdoors, being outdoors for this amount of time, having done something tremendously ard arduous, the risk of snow is the same. You know, a lot of the people have changed, and there's more people. And you know, a big change these days has been the electronics aspect. Oh yeah, gut hook. Mm -hmm. um, navigation. And navigation, and also in touch. You know, the, there's so much the trail these days, you can actually still be in touch. You, you know, you, you've done your text and you're holding it up, trying to get coverage. <laughs> and that's a change. But this resource, I hope, I hope 30 years, 60 years from now, people will still, the heart of it, it'll still remain an epic journey. And I think that's a perfect place to, to end it. Uh, thank you so much um, to, we have Scout, Frodo, and Snorkel. Thank you so much to the three of you for this conversation. Um, thanks to all of you out there for spending your evening with us. Please learn more about this book and purchase Journeys North at harvard.com. I'm going to repost the uh, purchase link on the chat. 
on behalf of Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge, Mass. And I'm beaming in from Nashville. Have a good night. Keep reading and stay safe. And thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nell. Hey.